I'm Brian Anderson, the editor of City Journal, and I'm here with Charles Kessler, editor of the Claremont Review of Books and a professor of government at Claremont McKenna College. Charles Kessler has written a brand new book called I Am the Change, Barack Obama and the Crisis of Liberalism, and he's come by to talk about his book today. Charles, welcome and thank you for coming in. Thank you, Brian. It's uh, very kind of you to invite me. In your book, you argue that President Obama is the latest exemplar of a long tradition of progressivism dating back to the early part of the 20th century. Who are President Obama's predecessors in that tradition, and what has he taken from them? Um, in my book, I talk about um, the tradition of liberalism that began almost exactly 100 years ago, breaking into our, into our politics in the 1912 election when Woodrow Wilson became president. Um, his most illustrious predecessors as liberals are Woodrow Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s, of course, and himself. And his um, desire to transform America is really the fourth such desire, the fourth stage of transformation, since at least as I understand them, each of these great captains of liberalism who came before him were also seeking in their own ways to transform the country. Uh, what did he get from them? Uh, in, in a very brief compass, the idea of the living constitution and the idea of leadership, presidential leadership in the modern sense from Woodrow Wilson, uh, the notion of liberalism itself as the title for this philosophy and entitlements as the socioeconomic platform uh, for liberalism from FDR, uh, from Lyndon Johnson, a kind of um, hypertrophied uh, New Deal, uh, trying, uh, a bureaucracy even more pervasive and centralized than anything that survived from the New Deal era. Uh, and along with that, of course, the politics of meaning, which is a great theme of the 60s and shared by both Lyndon Johnson and by his critics, interestingly, on the radical left. Charles, you see this tradition as somehow this progressive tradition is somehow uh, counter to the principles of the American founding. How so? You could say that from the very beginning Woodrow Wilson uh, expressed liberalism's impatience with the Constitution and the forms of our government and the formalities and traditions of our government, which he thought were obsolete. Wilson was the first president to criticize the Constitution and his criticism was that it was an 18th century document outmoded and just not up to the job of 20th century governance. Uh, in, f in, in place of it, he urged what he called the living constitution and what liberals still call the living constitution, which is one that in his own uh, phraseology was Darwinian in structure and uh, function. Darwinian in the sense that it, it was open to change and the idea was that it could change easily with changing political circumstances. And so for the first time in our history, instead of trying to keep the times in tune with the Constitution, Wilson's commandment and liberalism's commandment ever since has been to try to keep the Constitution in tune with the times. Uh, it's in that sense and in very many different perm uh, permutations that liberalism continues as a a critical force as, a, as an attempt to supplant uh, rather than perfect our constitutional arrangements. In your book, you argue that President Obama may be the final wave of this liberal tradition, that the policies he embraces, the ideas uh, he espouses, are running up against very harsh realities that are undermining the liberal worldview. Indeed, this is how you conclude your book. Um, what is your evidence for this, uh, this contention? My argument is that he may be the last uh, great liberal president from a liberal's point of view. And that's because liberalism seems to me to be at a turning point, which is what I call uh, the crisis of liberalism. And that crisis is twofold. Liberalism is running out of money and it's running out of ideas. Uh, it's running out of money most conspicuously in that it simply can't afford to pay for all of the entitlements that it has uh, created so far, and of course it is quite capable of minting new entitlements any, any day, any day now, um, and it can't pay for the ones that are already out there. The crisis in ideas, it seems to me, is perfectly exemplified in something like the Obamacare legislation, 
this monstrosity, almost 3,000 pages long, uh, could have come out of the Rexford Tugwell School of Public Administration in 1932. Uh, it, is the, it is the opposite of uh, a, a sort of modern, agile, uh, uh, fleet-footed arrangements that most Americans are used to in the cyber world and in the business world. It is a top-down, uh, old-fashioned, command-and-control kind of bureaucracy that arrogates tremendous amounts of power to itself, to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, to the IPAB board, and to many other uh, entities that it creates. And uh, in this sense, I think um, Obama is approaching the precipice uh, uh, at the end of liberalism. On the other hand, I think it is also possible, none, none of this is determined, and so I think it's quite possible that uh, he could, he or liberalism could, could radicalize and survive by radicalizing itself. And that possibility it seems to me points to a much larger state, a much more socialist or democratic socialist uh, order uh, socially and politically uh, in the United States. Uh, and a, a real change in the American character and in the relation of Americans to their government. Even if President Obama is the last figure in this tradition, uh, he's currently running neck and neck in the polls. Many polls have him ahead. Uh, what happens if he wins the election? What is his agenda going to be like? And do you perhaps see him as a kind of transformative figure in American political life? In a second Obama administration, uh, I don't think the lions will lie down with the lambs. Uh, I think it more likely that uh, there will be increased polarization and, uh, and, and partisanship in American politics. Uh, you might think that that's impossible, but it really isn't. I mean, I, I think what the future would hold for us in that case would, depending upon what happens in the election with Congress, uh, what you'll see is President Obama pushing executive authority to the utmost. Uh, using executive orders as much as he can to circumvent uh, or override Congress. And you'll see him move down the checklist of the liberal agenda. Um, having accomplished Obamacare and with his reelection protected Obamacare, I think he would begin to think about a child care, a federal child care program, a right to child care that the federal government would, would uh, have to uh, intervene to guarantee. Uh, and you would see an increasing um, expansion of um, governmental power and ambition uh, in our politics. Because one of the things he's been very adept at doing in his first term is laying down markers that he can pick up later on and, uh, and push the definition of, um, of the American agenda further and further left, uh, as it was with gay marriage. First he was against it, then he, was, he had an evolving position, and then to no one's surprise he came out uh, in favor of it. So it would be, it seems to me, with many more redistributive elements on the economic side. Uh, I think he, uh, uh, he may not rest uh, content with 39.5% as the top marginal tax rate, but there are many other areas where in the long term, needing revenue, he or his successors will have to push for a, a value-added tax or a much higher income tax. Thank you very much, Charles, for coming by. And thank you all for watching. The book is I Am the Change, Barack Obama and the Crisis of Liberalism, the author, Charles Kessler. It's a book well worth reading to understand the dynamic of this election, the dynamic of the Obama presidency. Thanks again.